Okay, it's lovely to have all of you on this evening. I'm sure you can see Dr. Judy Ratner on with us this evening as well. Um, before we hop into some questions for Dr. Ratner, I just want to get everyone oriented to, to Zoom. I know some people are quite familiar with it um, after doing school online during COVID. But if you are unfamiliar, please feel free to um, pop a message in the chat if you do want to ask any questions during the session or comment on anything. You're also welcome to leave any questions in the Q&A. If you're joining us on Facebook, you're welcome to leave us a comment and we will answer your question as soon as we're able to. Uh, Dr. Ratner, maybe you can give us a quick intro. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, so as Michaela said, I am Judy Ratner. I am a veterinary surgeon working at a local practice here in Durban. And um, yeah, I've been qualified for a couple of years now. Um, a little bit of a CV, I didn't go straight away to Honours the Put. I did a BSc Honours at the UKZN campus first, and then I started to work because I actually, long story short, didn't get in, and then I did get in, and then the funding was a problem. And so then I worked for a little bit for UKZN Wildlife, and then I managed to get a bursary to get into Honours the Put, so that's when I went. So I did a slightly different route than most people would. Um, but yeah, still got in that way to the normal qualification. Lovely. Okay, so for those of you who haven't had a chance to read the bio that we sent out about Dr. Ratna over here, I know she's covered some of it, but what's really interesting is just how perseverant and dedicated she was to, um, in terms of getting her degree and, and being able to do that. Um, Dr. Ratna started two businesses over her course of um, studying um, her two degrees that she achieved over um, the period of time where she was working towards her qualifications um, in order to fund her studies. And so, and we know how, um, how intensive these programs are. And so it's just so wonderful to have you here with us this evening. So I'm going to get going with some of the questions. As I mentioned, please do feel free to, to leave any questions. Angelica, I know that you emailed us. I've got your questions. So we've already got some of yours, but if you have any more, feel free to leave that as well. Okay. So um, Dr. Ratner is a close friend of mine. If I call her Judy, now you know, <laughs> because I think that's naturally going to happen in the session. Um, maybe you could provide us just with an overview of um, your role as a veterinary surgeon. What are the kinds of tasks that you have to go through on a day to day? What are your responsibilities? Just a, a general idea. Okay, so when you qualify, you pretty much qualify as a jack of all trades and master of none. So you can do a little bit of horses, you can do a little bit of cattle, you can do a little bit of pigs, sheep, goats wildlife, you can do a little bit of everything. And then once you finish, you tend to go into the stream of work that you want to pursue. So mine was cats and dogs. I thought I wanted to be a horse vet until I got to Honest Put. And then I realized very quickly, I didn't want to be a horse vet. So um, by the time I qualified, I knew I wanted to do cats and dogs only. So I'm a cat and dog vet only. So if you speak to a wildlife vet, they're going to give you a very different day-to-day -day scenario than I will. But let me maybe run you through what we do. So there's different levels of practices. You're going to have your practice in the rural setting where it's a one person who does everything. And then you're going to have your very small practices, medium practices, your large practices where they've got multiple vets, specialists, nurses, the whole bank shoot. So we kind of fall into the small to medium. So my day is a combination of doing uh, consultations in the morning and afternoons. And then in the middle of the day, we do procedures. So procedures is anything from taking x-rays to doing abdominal and ultrasounds, echocardiograms, any surgeries that need to happen, including dental work too. So anything you pretty much need to not be with a client for happens in the middle of the day. So morning is consult over pretty much 10 till 3, we do procedures and then afternoon is consult again. Okay, that is so interesting. I never knew that. Um, okay, and in terms of what led you to this point, because I know you started off studying one degree and then you shifted into veterinary. Was veterinary always something that you wanted to do and you just took a different route or 
Um, were you looking for a different career path and ended up being interested in veterinary? No, not at all. So my earliest memories of the what I wanted to do was vet. Um, and I can't tell you why or how, but I was just drawn to being a vet. My parents' best friends was a veterinarian. So I think I, I did see him and spend some time with him. And that's kind of what showed me what the profession was a little bit. But from the earliest memories I have, I, 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 that's all I ever wanted to do. So the, the long route to get there wasn't because I didn't want it. It was because it wasn't possible for various reasons. Um, so yeah, my earliest memories are wanting to be a vet and I uh, didn't get into veterinary initially. And then it was a financial issue after that. So then I got into it, but couldn't afford it. So it was always something I wanted to do. And funny enough, when I was working in the other jobs, um, I worked at a forestry and research uh, agricultural institute. I worked for KZN Wildlife. And all the times I was working for those people and working under vets, I was frustrated. I felt like I wanted to be doing what they were doing. I wanted to be that person making those decisions. So even though I was there in a qualified capacity, it wasn't what I wanted to do. So it was kind of a case of just persevere, persevere, persevere. And eventually the door will open and it did. Okay. Okay. Amazing. Um, and how did you find your experience um, at university once you got into veterinary and you were studying? Was it what you expected? Was there anything different about that experience that you were uh, it not? It wasn't what I expected. <laughs> it was a lot harder. It was a lot harder. Uh, and I think I, I, I say it was a lot harder because I actually had another degree to compare it to. You know, if you go straight into the veterinary field, you don't really know any different. Like this is hard work. I'm going to just get stuck in and this is hard work. But having come from a BSc honours before that, um, I realised there was a very big difference in what is expected of you in this mm. other degree. So mm. um, it's definitely much harder than I anticipated. You pretty much eat, breathe, live veterinary. And mm. um, I think it's important to go in knowing that and knowing that it is an all-consuming degree. You, you need to fight for time for anything else because you don't have the time you don't have the time you have to make the time so you know you actually need to make yourself more of a well-rounded individual because otherwise you'll do nothing else except that and it, and unfortunately in this profession it's exactly the same thing now that I'm working I still find myself having to fight for time for family fight for time for friends because otherwise the job can be all-consuming hmm. Hmm. No, that makes complete sense. Um, and I suppose that's also one of the key reasons why it's so competitive to get into the degree in the first place, because you need to um, be of a certain caliber. You need to be able to handle that level of pressure in that environment. So that's quite interesting. Um, and I just want to get to a question that's popped up in the chat now because it's pretty on topic, which is if you don't get into veterinary science initially, what are some of the options that you have or can take moving forward to try and get accepted again? And I'm sure there are some things that may have changed between when you studied versus now. But I think based on your experience of at the time, what were some of the options um, that you could pursue to get into veterinary via another no. I think I think one thing that that um, that one needs to know is that there is there is other options. There definitely is, but a lot of it is going to stem down to at which institution you want to do your studying. Just to give you an idea, so the veterinary degree is a six-year degree, and it is I won't say easier because easier is not the right word, but if you go from a trick to study at University of Pretoria, so Tuckies, they've got a veterinary specific BSc first year. So because they've got a veterinary specific BSc first year, uh, you're a lot I want better equipped possibly is the word to say, to move into the, on, to move across to honest put. Um, I didn't do it that way for various reasons, but so I did my first year BSc at UKZN, but the same credits and the same subjects, are, they're not the same. So your 
if you're wanting to, if you're not sure if you want to be a vet, let's maybe say that, then I think you need to make sure first. Because once you start the process, it, it will lead to the next process. It will lead to the next process. And if you're going to do it my way, it's going to be much longer. Um, and you won't necessarily carry the credits. So what they did previously was they said everyone must actually do a first year BSc. And then you'll soon figure out, is this what you want to, win, what you want to do? And if you say no, that's fine. Then you can do your BSc second year, BSc third year honors if you want to. And you can branch off. But the BSc veterinary at Tuckies is quite specific. So, and you must also know that if you take one across from another university, the credits are not the same. So like I did that and I had to spend a year filling in gaps mm. that, that I wouldn't have had to do had I done it at Tuckies. Okay. Wow. Um, in your experience, I know I just asked the question of was studying what you expected. Um, so now it's switch it over to now you've, you started working um, in the veterinary field. Was it what you expected? What were some of the challenges that you, you faced that you were not expecting to face at the time? Um, it is what I expected. It is what I expected. And I think they've changed the veterinary program slightly now to give you um, 18 months of practical work at the end of your course. So you pretty much know what's coming in the working world. So because your last 18 months is spent working in clinics in various places, you know what's going to be expected. The learning curve is very steep once you get out though, because you haven't got the clinicians and the teachers to fall back on and say, hey, I don't know what this is. Can you help me with this? You literally will leave your consult room, go to the back, open a textbook and say, I don't remember this. I have to look it up, you know, but um, so your learning curve when you leave is very steep. But once you get your groove and once you see the same, very similar symptoms and clients and um, disease processes, you can pretty much, you know, become a second nature. It's just kind of like, that's what you do every day. So it's very similar to what I expected it to be. Um, I know now that part of your application process they actually have what's called shadowing. So when you fill in your application process now for honest support, there's not just your marks. So your marks is the most important. You have to get the marks to be able to even be considered. And then the next level is they have amounts of shadowing. So you've also got to submit how many hours you've shadowed. And the reason they want that from you is to know, actually, is this really what you want? Have you worked at a vet before? Obviously, it's a volunteer basis. Have you worked uh, under another clinician? Have you, have you had some exposure to this and you're not now being exposed to it the first time you get you know, into university. So that's the second thing they actually look for uh, now too. And the third thing they're also looking for is well-roundedness. Have you got mm -hmm. other things that make you tick that are going to keep you going that are going to keep you strong and and um i know it sounds strange but uh your your like your mental stability is, is actually really important because if you have any hesitation that this might not be the right thing for you it probably isn't um and you might end up going along the wrong career path from the get-go so i think that's why they changed it to doing that first year bsc so if you finding you doing it the first year BSc and it doesn't work out for you. You haven't wasted a year. You can then do the second year BSc in another field. You can veer off into plant pathology or viruses or something else completely different and you haven't wasted that time. Mm. No, that's very interesting. Um, what are some of those challenges that you have faced um, in your kind of career? What are some of the challenging aspects of being a veterinary surgeon? How have you overcome those? Um, yeah, maybe you can chat to that. Um, I think probably my biggest challenge is, and I don't know if it's a girl thing, but is to, is to actually uh, leave work at work. So when you get home, you've got to be at home and present with family or mm -hmm you must make time to go on holiday. And then when you go on holiday, be present on the holiday and don't try and work at the same time. So I battle to not think about work when I'm at home or when I'm away or when I'm somewhere else. So that's mm -hmm. one of the big challenges that I've had to try and say, okay, you know, put your phone down and just don't worry about work. Work's going to go on whether you're there or not, you know? So separating the two is one of my challenges. And I think maybe one of the other challenges is um, becoming a bit tougher skinned. Uh, I used to be a very, very, very sensitive person and it's across the board sensitive when it comes to my patient care, 
You know, if you'd lose a patient, I'd be very upset about it. And it's not to say you can't be upset, but it's to say that you can't let it affect you, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So, you know, you're going to have loss. You're going to have loss in this profession. And you need to know that you've done the best you can and loss is going to happen no matter what you've done for that particular patient. Um, mm -hmm. So trying to be a little bit thicker skin from that aspect, loss with patients and also mm -hmm. with clients. I think um, you some clients can be very tricky to handle. Some uh, some people and every profession has its meanies. Uh, we're not saying it's strictly you know veterinary only. Every profession has its meanies, um, and they are there too. And those meanies are not the animals generally; it's the owners who can give you a hard time. So being a bit thicker skinned is what I've had to learn, and separating work and home life. Mm, no, and I think it's it's all things that stem from you caring. Right. It's like caring about work you and wanting so. to yeah, you hope well. So. And so it's difficult to leave behind and caring about the patients. And so, um, yeah, needing to develop that separation and that thicker skin. So just with with those kind of challenging aspects in mind and maybe some others that you haven't mentioned, because maybe the, those are skills that you currently already possess. What are some of the key skills and qualities that you feel students who are thinking about getting into veterinary? Um, what are some of those skills and qualities they should have already or should be working towards um, achieving, in your opinion? Mm. There, there's so many. And the thing is, I also think that every vet is so different. You know, mm. uh, uh, my husband is a vet and um, we practice very differently. We, you know, we practice very differently in that uh, how we communicate with our clients is different, how we uh, do our work is slightly different. And I think one thing that um, would be helpful would be know your strengths, know where your strengths lie and um, let those be your strengths. You know, you should never say, uh, I'll tell you one of my weaknesses is my administration skills. And, um, uh, and you just got to say to yourself, okay, well, I know this is a weakness. I know I must work on it, but I also know that my strengths are maybe communication skills with, with clients. And I think that's probably one thing I'd, I'd maybe emphasize a bit is learning how to communicate with clients in a way that's not jargon. And that's not, you know, you can connect with someone and say, and explain a situation and explain the process and the procedure in a way that they'll understand and that mm. they'll know that you're trying to come across and help them. So communication is the, the, uh, is one thing that is very good. And if you could, you know, get better at communication. Um, trying to think what else I mentioned being thick skinned. That's also quite important. Yeah. Um, just being someone who doesn't give up um, because there's going to be lots of times when you're, even once you're in the degree that you're going to give up. I did. I did. I gave up halfway through, even though I went through all of that to get in. I think I applied six times to honest support and, and I, either didn't get in or I couldn't afford it or something, something held in the way. And finally on the sixth time I got in and um, halfway through, I gave up. I did because it was tough. It was tough. Mm -hmm. And I was really struggling and um, having that grit of just, uh, I gave up and uh, I came back after mm -hmm. a couple of months and I had to sit a whole bunch of exams and they were very kind to me and let me come back in, which they didn't have to do. But just knowing that, uh, even though it's going to be hard, don't give up because, you know, yeah. it, it's a, you're one of the elite few who've been selected. I spoke to um, one of the administration ladies today at Autosport and I said to her, you know, how many applications do you get? And she was like easily over a thousand and there's only a hundred posts that are taken each year. So mm -hmm. if you're going to be one of those few who gets in, have the grit to stick it out and know it's going to be hard, but, mm -hmm. but um, You've just got to persevere and, and get through it because, yeah, you will get through it and it's tough, but you want, you were chosen for a reason to be there and um, your, your calling is to be there. So just do whatever it takes to, to finish. Yeah, no, that's great advice. Um, I know that we haven't really chatted to this, but based on our discussions that you have a particular interest in um, a specific type of surgery. So maybe you want to explain that a little bit and then I have a follow-up question. Um, so you can, uh, because there's cats and dogs that I do, but there's also kind of um, different interests. So you can have an interest in medicine um, and that means that you're interested in solving diseases. So if your animal has got diabetes, 
which they get, um, then you are interested in fixing it and solving it and managing it. Um, my interest is soft tissue surgery. So I really enjoy um, a lot of oncology work. So removing tumors, reconstruction, so large skin flaps and techniques, or like removing liver lobes and uh, lung lobes and things like that. So anything to do with soft tissue, not bone, um, because there's not a, uh, a huge array of vets around at the moment about more than half have either left the country or the profession you've kind of got to then start doing things you're uncomfortable with sometimes so I do I've started doing more orthopedics now and it doesn't come naturally to me I don't know if it's just because I'm a girl and I'm not used to using a saw and a drill and a you know so I've had to like really wire my brain around doing that um so that lets me have to teach myself after leaving OP. It doesn't come naturally to me, but yeah, I've had to now start doing orthopedic surgeries and I'm now starting to enjoy it, but you never stop learning. And um, yeah, I just got to keep pushing yourself and, and covering what's needed because there's no point if you can't do it and no one else is available to do it. So just got to mm -hmm. get it done. <laughs> mm -hmm. That makes sense. So we actually had a question come through um, yesterday from one of the students who's joined us online from Angelica, and she was asking do all veterinarians do surgeries or can they choose to only do examinations on animals? That'll depend on who you're working for or if you're working for yourself. So there are a lot of practices um, that don't, don't have a theatre, for example. So they will just do your consultations and then they can refer you across should your animal need surgery. Um, but if you're in a, a multidisciplinary practice like we're at, we've got the vets who don't like surgery. Um, and then they will say, please, can you do my surgery for me? And then I'll do it for them. And because I like the surgery, I'll do it. So I think it just depends on where you work. You're going to have to qualify in everything, in all the animals and in all the techniques and in all the everything. But um, you're only going to actually start doing surgeries when you are working. It sounds quite scary. When you're at Ornestop Work, you only ever uh, do neuters and spays. That's all you do. That's all the surgery that you are doing where you're being shadowed. Once you leave, that is when you actually have your biggest learning curve because that's when you've got, you hopefully will be employed by someone who's going to teach you. And if not, you're going to have a, hope I can say this, a cadaver and you're going to practice. You're going to practice if that's your interest. If it's not your interest, look for a practice that will employ you that doesn't necessarily need a surgeon or doesn't have a theater, or you can you can share with each other, or open your own practice. That's the options, really. Okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so there's, I mean, the field of veterinary is so wide. It's huge. And, yeah, it's um, huge. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, in terms of your day-to-day, -day, I know that we obviously, you studied um, at a varsity level, and then you qualified, and you're obviously learning on the job as you go, but I'm sure there are potentially advancements in some medical technology, um, uh, research, whatever it might be that could impact your day-to-day -day job. Is that something that you find happens pretty often? How often do you have to keep up with the trends in veterinary? So um, when you qualify as a vet, you've got to be registered with South African Veterinary Council. And in order to maintain your registration, you have to, you can't practice as a vet if you're not registered with the, with the veterinary council. So in mm -hmm. order to practice as a vet, you've also got to get a certain number of points every year. So you've got to do what, what's called continued professional development. And that is a way of forcing uh, you, yourself, and also the veterinary profession, forcing you to kind of stay up to date and not um, and not dwindle. So you've got to get a certain amount of points and that says, okay, well, you've been to so many lectures, you've read so many articles, you've um, whatever whatever it is. And then every now and again, you get audited. And, um, and that's usually on a three-year cycle. So then they're going to check you that you have actually stayed up to date. There are loads of things that are happening in the um, human medical world that haven't come across to veterinary yet, unfortunately. And it's mainly because that's where the, a large portion of funding has been pumped into making these devices and making the various things is for people. And mm -hmm. a lot of the times we are using the same medications, um, but the dosages are just different. Um, and then there is animal specific medication too. So obviously that's not available to people, um, but then a lot of um, your instruments and your other medical advancements, especially in oncology, 
does feed across from from humans, but they've got to then do all the testing on animals first. It's not like we can just say, okay, well, this drug or this implant or whatever works on a person, we can now use it on animals. Not the case at all. It has to be tried and tried and tested and trialed before it happens. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I'm going to pivot quite a bit now. Um, I know that there's an unspoken part of the veterinary world that's not necessarily the most positive that people don't really talk about. And I think it is important to highlight a bit of some of the dark sides of veterinary in terms of um, dissatisfaction with, with jobs that, that is quite common in the field. But I know you'll have a lot more insight, so maybe you can speak a bit to that now. So as I said earlier, um, let's just say we've got uh, over a thousand applicants to get in. Then once you get your 100 that's kind of starting in your first year or so, the maximum capacity on us to put in the moment, I think she said, is around about 180. Um, mm -hmm. So they can get people who join in from other um, criteria. So your postgraduates will form into a different field. But the majority at the moment is, let's say, a class of 180 for the whole country. That's all that's qualifying. And then once they qualify, you're then going to realize that the majority of vets are women. Uh, and I think one of the big reasons for that is I think a lot of girls are more driven to the academia side of things. So their marks are good, but the women are the ones that leave to have children. Um, so they're going to then say either they're going to take a maternity leave or they're going to take a maternity leave and not come back. Um, so a lot of the people who are qualifying no longer work. And a lot of it is because of that. Uh, the other reason is because once you actually get out into the field, you realize the hours are tough the clients are tough some of the animals are tough and um, you'd rather not be a practicing veterinarian but you can go into other fields so do, don't be disheartened and thinking that okay well if i don't like doing surgery i don't i don't have to be i don't want to be a vet or i don't want to deal with people on that aspect even just having the qualification can lead you across uh, multiple levels like my one of my closest friends has gone into pharmaceuticals so she's in the veterinary pharmaceutical uh, department and um, for a very big pharmaceutical company she works eight till four she's very happy in her job but she hasn't touched an animal since she left on her support so like there is other avenues you can take there, but uh, there are a lot of people that don't continue to be a vet because of that either mm -hmm. because of having a family or because you want to immigrate and leave the country and practice over there. And then there's also the other side of things where you don't manage, you know, um, I have lost a couple of classmates to suicide. And I know that in the veterinary industry, there is a lot of suicide. And I think it also boils down to having that balance. And that is why they've made it one of the criteria now is because they've recognized that the suicide rate in veterinarians is high and it's, it shouldn't be. And, um, it's got to do with making sure that you're mentally able to not only do the qualification, but then do the work at the end of the day and that you are, are more well-rounded so that you're not just eating and breathing and living this uh, work all day because it can be all consuming. And yeah, that that's, that's pretty much the worst thing that can happen and it has happened and it is happening. So mm -hmm. it's a very real thing that we need to know about and, and look out for in friends as well who are there. Yeah. No, so, so important. Um, and yeah, I think it's often unspoken. People like to view veterinary um, as a field as um, such a, I don't know, a lighthearted kind of, I get to yeah, work on I think a lot of the times and... everyone just thinks you, you're you sitting on the floor playing with puppies and you're not. Yeah. Um, but that is worth saying. I think uh, if a lot of people who are thinking of going into the veterinary field might be confusing it with veterinary nursing um, because your veterinary nurses are the people who are mainly with your animals all day every day so they are the ones who are you know caring for them feeding them giving them medication being mm -hmm. the one who who pulls them through a lot you know the veterinary mm -hmm. nurses are the hands-on and um, it's not to say that if you get the really great marks you've got to become a vet that's not the case at all it's actually where your passion lies so the nurse who works for us at the moment she was ducks of her school she could easily have become a vet but she came and shadowed for a bit in our practice and she soon realized that she didn't actually want to be a vet she wants to be the person who actually 
looked after the animals and helped mm. them recover after the surgery and made mm. sure that they got all medication they did. So vets, unfortunately, uh, depending on how big your practice is or how hands-on you are, you're, you're pretty much making a lot of decisions, which are really important and you are hands-on, but your nurses are the ones who are caring for the patients all day, every day. And, and the veterinary nursing has changed from a diploma to a degree now. So not only can you get a degree in it, you can also now do postgraduate in nursing too. So if that's more of what you're thinking it is, um, then that's something worth considering. Because yeah. it's, it's really, it's internationally renowned. It is internationally recognized. And it's a degree now too with postgraduate opportunities. You can't change from being a vet nursing degree to a nursing degree, to a veterinary degree. You can't change, you know, you'll have to go back uh, and start again. So, but it might be worthwhile. And if you're trying to decide, well, which person are you? Are you the person who wants to be on the floor with the animal in your arms, recovering, you know, making sure they're well, uh, then maybe vet nursing degree is more what's your calling as opposed to being a vet. Hmm. No, that's, that's so good to know. And I think a lot of people overlook the vet nurse um, qualification mm. Versus, mm. And, and you know the first thing you think of is a is mm. becoming a vet um, mm. I think it's hard as a student in school to really understand the depth of a lot of um, career categories um, and veterinary science is such a broad um, field when you really start looking into it mm. um, just taking a turn for the more positive now okay. um, could you share any memorable or maybe rewarding experiences that you've had um in your season of being a vet there's actually too many I'm really lucky in that sure um there's so many there's so many like just to be able to uh pull an animal through who's really sick who you really think is not going to make it or you know have an animal come in that's been knocked by a car and then be able to go in and fix it and um every single day is rewarding every single day is rewarding make no mistake um, I don't think I would carry on if it wasn't. And you get that warm, fuzzy feeling when, you know, when when you when you're able to fix something and you're able to help them. And also I think um the the animal human bond has changed. It's mm -hmm. uh a long time ago, they they didn't have the the level of bond. You know, animals used to be outdoors. We used to be indoors. But now, you know, animals are sleeping in, in people's beds. They're part of the family, and mm -hmm. they are they need they, they are just as loved um, by the owners as their own children are. Sometimes they replace the children. You know, so you've got to know that you know you're treating someone's child every single day, and it's really rewarding when you can turn that around. So I think every day there is there isn't a particular one that I can say uh, that stands out more than any, but um, yeah, no, just every, every single day. And, and, and if you are going to the vet at the moment, just always uh, like, thank your vet <laughs> if you, because a lot of the time you, you don't realize how much, uh, you know, they go home and worry about your dog that they saw today. You know, they, they're not switching off. They're saying, I hope that did the right thing. I hope that animal is going to make it. And yeah, it's every every day is rewarding. There's nothing I can say in particular. Sorry. No, no, that's that's great. I mean, yeah, really good to know. Um, I do want to get to one of the questions that we had come up from Angela as well. She wanted to know whether physical science was a required subject um, to getting into veterinary in the first place. So your only three required subjects is science maths and english so biology is not a requirement um, but physical science definitely is biology is a requirement for animal uh, veterinary nursing um i would say that if you are going to get into veterinary the triple science package is recommended though so your math science and biology just to stand you in good stead but mm -hmm. yeah to answer that question science is definitely needed and it's um it's it's one of the tough ones especially chemistry I didn't do very well in chemistry at all which is why I never got in twice is because I didn't manage my chemistry but you know even if you're not very good at science you just actually have to get it to get in and there's not much thereafter so it's not too bad <laughs> no that's that's really good to know um okay and then I I have another question that's popped up in the chat um, which is, do you have any regret, regrets about this career or field of study? No, no. 
And uh, I, for whatever reason, I knew I wanted to do it since I was little. And um, the very first operation that I watched, I was six. And I'll never forget, it was a femur head and neck excision. And uh, I remember standing in the operating theater because my parent's friend was a vet. He let me go. don't know why, but he let me come in and watch the op. And I remember feeling really queasy. And then I would just like close my eyes and I pulled through it. And it it's just been like, that was it. I was hooked. So I, I don't think I can have any regrets because it's something I always wanted to do. Um, mm. And I don't have any regrets, even though I did it the long way around. I feel like I gained a lot of life experience in doing that. And I was a different student because I was a bit older um, and I was working at the same time. But that's OK. You know, at, by the time you are at the university level, your individualism is um, is more appreciated and it. It helps. I think at yeah. school level, a lot of uh, teachers in schools try to make you all conform to be the same person. And at university, it's the very opposite, especially mm -hmm. at, at honest support. It's the very opposite. The more unique and the individual you are, and the more your your strength can play in somebody else's weakness. So, yeah, just very different, hey? No, that's that's so good to know. Um, I do want to give, if anyone does want to ask any questions, now would be a good time to type your question into the, the Q&A or the chat um, while I end on, on my final question for you. Um, which is what advice would you give to students who are considering a career in veterinary science? Any last words of advice? No, I just think if you if you really make sure that you really want it. That's actually what I'm going to say. Make sure that they, you've done your due diligence in knowing what's required of you. You've done your due diligence in knowing um, what's expected. Some shadowing of uh, vets. Most veterinary practices will take school levels, even if it's just for a day or two, um, and just see that this is what you want. And if it is what you want, just, just do it. Just do it and don't give up because um, it's worth it at the end of the day. It really is. And... Uh, as I said, even if you don't end up being the practicing veterinarian like I am, there's so much that's open to you internationally. And uh, this, this degree, veterinary and veterinary nursing degrees, will always have job opportunity. Always. This is something that's one of those skill sets that is needed everywhere. So you'll always be able to, to get a job. So in this day and age where a lot of things are changing and employment rates are unemployment rates are so high, that's at least one thing that you can uh, be guaranteed with in life that there will be employment out there too. So if it's something that you want, just stick with it um, and know what you're getting in for. And uh, if you need help, ask for help from however way, way or form, friends, family, colleagues, other veterinarians, whatever. Everyone's everyone's in it together and everyone knows what it takes to get through it. So everyone's always there to help each other. Hmm. That's amazing. Um, okay, so I don't see any additional questions coming through. You are always welcome to email info at advantagelearn.com if you have a question, a burning question on your mind this evening, so that we can get um Dr. Ratner to, to help us with an answer for you before we, we send through an email. We always do a summary email um, after doing a session like this. So you'll have some um, information that we'll send through to you. Oh, sorry, I've just seen a question. Um, what is the mini minimum APS score you should achieve to be accepted? I don't know, Dr. Ratner, if you know that off the top of your head. What is an APS okay. score? That's different to my... Yeah, so I think Aziza, let's put that in the email to you guys. We'll make sure to get a proper response um, for you. Um, but I would say, honestly, um, for veterinary, it's so competitive that you really shouldn't be looking to hit a minimum. Um, mm. That's that's my um, take on it. I've only ever heard, I'm sure Dr. Ed, Dr. Atna can attest to it. Um, you can hear how many times that she's had to apply into the program. It is a highly competitive degree. So you really have to be top, top, top um, results to to get into veterinary in the first place. I'm happy to give you um, 
the uh, I'll leave it with Michaela, the veterinary um, administration and application email. Um, when I discussed everything with her today, she said it, she said that she was happy to put it on this platform and that you could email her and ask mm -hmm. exactly those kind of questions. But there is also a brochure that Michaela said that she'll send out afterward, which gives a lot of information, detailed information on exact scoring systems and how what you need to get in and so forth. So we'll send both of those things off as well. Perfect. Um, and then Aziza also has another question, which is, is it easier to get into vet nursing rather than to become a vet? You mean get into vet nursing instead of the veterinary degree? Yes. Um, I, th I think it's going to depend on the amount of applications. I would think it's very similar. But I don't think the veterinary nursing has as many applicants as the veterinary degree does. But that might be something that you chat to um, DeAndre about. Yeah, she administrator. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's it's just got to do with the amount of people that are applying and, and what your marks are. Yeah, that's that's good to know. Um, Adi has a question as well. If you fail to obtain the requirements to be accepted into the field the first time, are there any ways to reapply? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, lots of them. So it, that's why I say it depends on which, to, which um, university you're applying to. So you can do um, a BSc at any university, a BSc first year at any university, and you can send your matric results up. If you don't get it on your matric results, then I'd suggest you do a BSc first year, but it would be better to do the BSc first year at Takis, at University of Pretoria. But if you don't, you can do it at any university and then reapply. So you can reapply every single year, like I did, <laughs> until eventually you get in. Um, and and or it, you know it might be a mark thing. It might be um, they do have different categories. So like as I said, I fell into the postgraduate category, and I think there's like ten applicants that can apply on the postgraduate level. And I think there was only three of us who applied. So you know if you if you straight away want to say okay, well I'm not going to be competing against a thousand people. I'm going to compete against ten people. Well maybe I'll do a degree first and then apply. So there's definitely other ways around it if you don't get in the first time. Mm. Yeah, that's good to note. Um, okay, great. We do have <laughs> another one. Sorry. So okay. is it important to have extra curriculum activities on your portfolio? Yes, yes. So they look at a number of things. First of all, your marks. Second of all, have you done any shadowing? Have you done any experience? Do you know what you're getting in for? How much shadowing experience have you done? The third thing is what are your what is your life? What do you what do you do? Do you belong? Do you sing? Do you kayak? Do you what do you do? They want to see all of that. They want to know that you're a well-rounded individual and that you can cope with the stresses and the pressures and still have an outlet. So yes, I and you'll see when you're doing the online application, that is one of the things they ask you is what are the other things that you do? And if you can do those things and do them well, that's helpful, you know, belong to certain clubs and things like that, because I know you're dedicated to something else and you're also going to make it an important part of your life, not just veterinary. I just wanted to make you aware, I know a lot of you are clearly interested in veterinary and are most likely high achieving students that are looking to do as well as possible. So I just wanted to make you aware of our exam preparation online courses, um, which we do have available across uh, physical science, life science, accounting, um, mathematics, you name it. So you guys are welcome to check that out. I'm going to leave a link in the chat if you are interested. It will also be in the follow-up mail. Um, and then we also have a self-study maths resources avail resource available um, in the form of video lessons and that sort of thing that you can use as a resource on an ongoing basis, not just in exam times. And so I'm going to send that through um, in the chat as well. And in terms of if you are looking to uh, email any more questions, Aziza, um, it's info at Advantage Learn, which I'm going to type in the chat. Uh, info at AdvantageLearn.com. There we go. Just so you guys have it available over there. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. If you are keen to hop off, you are welcome to at this point. If you do have any more questions, please stay on. We'll be on for another two or three minutes to see if anyone does. Thanks, everyone.